Tonight on Colonial Sports Center, field hockey looks for a chip shot against Merseyhurst. Can they upend the Lakers? Plus, volleyball looks to make a run. Can they ace the competition? And we go deep with Julian Ellison and the football team. Can an emotional trip to Monmouth turn a goat into a hero? So get a leg into this one. Split those pesky uprights. Throw your hands in the air because Colonial Sports Center starts right now. Salutations, welcome to Colonial Sports Center. Alongside Kelly Burke, I'm Andrew Chiapese, and lots to get to Kelly, including something that hasn't happened since 2002. Yeah, you would think with all the matchups the Robert Morris football team has had against Monmouth, the Colonials would have won a game against the Hawks in the past five years. Well, prior to Saturday's game at Monmouth, the Colonials hadn't. It was a somber football team that made the trip to West Long Branch, New Jersey on Saturday, and it had little to do with the loss to the Dayton Flyers the previous week. The Colonials made the trip without head coach Joe Walton, who stayed in the Pittsburgh area to be with his family after his wife Ginger passed away on Wednesday. Assistant head coach Dan Radakovich took the reins, and it was the first time that anyone other than Walton led the Robert Morris Colonials, a resolute Colonials team in search of an identity and a win. Early first, Monmouth is marching early on, and Brett Burke's going to avoid the sack by Jordan Howard, and he's going to pick up 11 yards on his own. As Burke gets out to the sideline, that's going to help set up a David Sinisi run a few plays later. Three yards out, he gets in TD Hawks, 7-0. Late second, 14-0 Hawks. Second and eight, Solinski's going to find Mario Hines. 51 yards to Super Mario. Out to the Monmouth 43-yard line. The Colonials like that play so much, they're going to run a similar one. Play action again, Solinski to Julian Ellison. Touchdown, Robert Morris. Ellison's first as a Colonial. 14-7 at the half. Yes, I said seven because Michael Walzer, a completed extra point. Second half, Miles Russ had a great game. Second game overall as a freshman, but one little hiccup. Right here, he loses the football, but an alert, Swolinski picks it up and takes off. 18 yards for the quarterback, and that's going to help set up a pass here. Swolinski using his arm instead of his legs to tight end Regis Flowers. 20-yard gain out to the four-yard line. And that's going to help set up a touchdown for Robert Morris. The first ever for Jeff Link, the freshman, rolling into the end zone. And again, Robert Morris gets a solid extra point from Michael Walzer here. 14-14, we're all tied up. Late in the third, Colonials looking for more. This time it's Solinski to Alvin Hill, 17 yards to match the uni number. Colonials threatening again, but they would be held to it. A Michael Walzer field goal. This one's good. 22 yards out, 17-14 RMU. Early fourth, Colonial is looking to extend the lead, and Swolinski is going to find area. No, that's Derek Bischoff. Wrong jersey. Colonials can't hold the Monmouth Hawks because Brett Burke's going to find Troy Uden. Down the sideline is going to get behind Tohi Bakanola, and that's going to help set up a chance for Monmouth to try and tie the game at 17. Fred Weingart gets it up, and it is through the uprights. We are indeed tied at 17. Miles Russo is going to help the Colonials get into the Michael Walzer's range because he's going to get out to the 26-yard line. A nice run by the freshman, and Walzer is going to have a chance to win this thing. From 36 yards out, Walzer, as cool as the other side of the pillow. 20 to 17. Robert Morris goes into Monmouth and gets a victory. It is the sixth road win in a row for Robert Morris, and as mentioned, they had not previously won against Monmouth since 2002. We knew we were better than they were. Um, we knew getting out there that um, that it was it was going to be a tough game. All conference games always are, and um, just them being on top. I mean, it might have worried us a little bit, but yet at the same time, we knew that all our games are usually close against them, and um, we always got to battle back. It's this team's not going to give up. We're a tough team. We have a lot of heart, and we want to win. So that's what we did. We just came out, stepped it up, and um, we won. Um, we kind of knew what we had to do get focused as a family with Coach Walton missing 
It was all or nothing. It was all for him. We came together as a family. Banizak put a lot of pressure on us, and we uh, we responded well. Here's a look at how some of the other teams in the NEC fared this weekend. LaSalle lost to Sacred Heart 54-14. Albany had a three-point win over Forum. Wagner lost by three to the Gales and Moorhead State 21-14 over St. Francis of PA. And there's Robert Morris 20-17 over Monmouth. Well, Michael Walzer knew he could kick at this level. He just had to prove it to himself. A week after missing two extra points and a field goal and a 23-12 loss to Dayton, the junior place kicker was perfect at Monmouth. For his efforts, Walzer was named the NEC Special Teams Player of the Week. We caught up with Walzer earlier this week. All right, we're here with uh, Colonials kicker Michael Walzer. And Mike, after a uh, rough start against Dayton, what was it like transitioning from the rough start against Dayton to throughout the week and into Monmouth's game? Well, Dayton, I had a horrible performance, and I came back and watched a lot of film, tried to pick out my flaws that I had during the game, and I worked on during the week and, and ended up paying off in the Monmouth game. Is there an explanation for what went on with, with Dayton, or is it just one of those things, one of those fluky games? I think it was just one of those fluky games. I've never had a day like that before, and it's just I don't know what went wrong, just basically everything. Now, uh, some of the reports from Mama said that it was a pretty b a nice day, but as far as the weather went uh, and, and the wind went, it was swirling around a little bit. How did, did that play into your uh, mindset at all? On um, the last field goal, it did. I knew the wind was going to be into me with the cross, so I tried to aim a little more to the right. But most of the points in the game were scored on the other end of the field where the wind was actually helping you the whole time. Obviously, it's always good to have a conference win, but you guys haven't beaten Monmouth since 2002. What was the atmosphere like during the entire game, especially knowing that some of your kicks were crucial kicks? Well, the atmosphere was great. It was a first conference game. It was the defending champs on their home field, and we knew to make a statement, we'd have to beat the champs right off the bat. And right now we're winning the conference 1-0, no, and it's a great game, hard-hitting game, very exciting the whole way, and we're just glad we can get the win for our coach. As far as special teams go, uh, coming up against St. Francis, uh, what do you guys expect in terms of kickoffs, in terms of their ability to rush on field goals? Um, we haven't looked at their abilities yet, at least I haven't. I'm sure Coach Banizak will pinpoint them all, and he'll get us ready for the game. All right, thank you very much. Hopefully you have another good game against St. Francis, Michael. Robert Morris football coach Joe Walton will return to the sidelines this Saturday as the Colonials take on Northeast Conference rival St. Francis. He had missed the past week of practice and last Saturday's game versus Monmouth as he remained with his family following the death of his wife, Ginger. Assistant head coach Dan Radakovich led the Colonials to a 20-17 win over Monmouth last Saturday. Game time this Saturday is at 1 p.m. at Joe Walton Stadium, and you can listen live on WPIT 7.30 a.m. or on Yahoo Sports. Still to come, we'll take a look at what's going on in the world of Pittsburgh sports, so stay tuned. The Pittsburgh Penguins begin their training camp on Friday, and all eyes are on a couple former collegians familiar to Robert Morris. Goalie David Brown and Notre Dame alum will be battling for a spot on the Penguins' depth chart, along with Boston University's John Curry and veteran Ty Conklin. One of Brown and Curry will start at Wilkes-Barre Scranton, and the other will start at Wheeling of the ECHL. If you're interested in attending training camp, here's some important Penguins dates to keep an eye on. The Penguins begin their training camp on Friday, and that is uh, going to be at the Isoplex in South Point. And also, first preseason game is December 7th, September 17th, and the season begins October 5th.
Monday night, while the Pirates hosted the Milwaukee Brewers, outfielder Nate McLeod took Carlos Villanueva deep into the river for the 1,000th home run at PNC Park. Since the park opened in 2001, 17 players have reached the Allegheny, and only former Pirate Daryl Ward has done it on the fly. This was McLeod's 12th of the season, which flew 431 feet. With the season winding down, here's a look at some of the top Pirate prospects. Brian Bixler is still in AAA with the Indianapolis Indians and is leading the squad in runs, hits, triples, and stolen bases. Andrew McCutcheon is hitting 313 in AAA ball and has one home run after spending most of the season with the Altoona Curve where he hit 258. Steve Pierce is currently in the big leagues where he has put up five RBIs in 34 at bats as a bucko after finishing up in Indianapolis hitting 320. Well, don't make the reservations for Arizona just yet, Steelers fans. Even with Bill Belichick illegally taping his way to victory in New England in a thorough thrashing of the dog pound in the books, your Pittsburgh Steelers have quite the path to follow. It resumes at home versus an emotionally charged Buffalo team looking to win one for uh, fallen teammate Kevin Everett. Everett severely injured his spine in a collision with Denver's Dominic Hickson on a kick return. Meanwhile, the Steelers are getting ready to... Uh, face the Bills and uh, against the beleaguered uh, Bills and break down the X's and O's and prepare us for Sunday's game. Here's Bill Romango. Mango, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, AJ. Uh, th say hello to the audience at home and why don't you start with the questions? Absolutely. We'll get right into it. How much will the Bills be looking to snag a victory to take home to Everett? Well, it's definitely going to be an emotional game for the Buffalo Bills. When you have a fallen teammate such as Everett, you want to come out and play for him, play hard for him, much like the Colonials did for uh, Joe Walton when he was not there this past weekend. But you got to remember that the Steelers are coming into this game, their first home game of the year, uh, Mike Tomlin's first home game. They're going to have the throwback jerseys on, so there's going to be a lot of the 75th anniversary stuff uh, happening before the game and at halftime and things like that. So while the Bills will be charged up, don't expect the Steelers just to lay down because, they're, oh, it's just the Bills and they're weak in the secondary. The, the Steelers are going to be ready for this game, and so are the Bills, obviously, with the loss of their player. You mentioned the secondary loss of injuries to the Bills defense in week one. They don't stack mm -hmm. up that well against any offense, really. How does that matchup shake out on Sunday? Well, that matchup is going to shake out basically where the Steelers are, once again, going to set up the pass with the run game. But once they do go deep downfield, they're more than likely going to have success. You see here just a nice pass play to Hines Ward. And the Steelers are going to look to do a lot of that against the Bills secondary. Uh, Jason Webster, a corner for the Bills, is out. He's on IR, and so is their safety, Co Simpson. And the Steelers are going to look to attack downfield as much as they can. And also uh, on the defense for the Steelers, they're going to look to attack J.P. Lossman as one of his receivers, uh, Josh Reed. is He's probable for the game, so even if he does play, he's not going to be 100%, so that could be a factor for the Steelers. Well, you mentioned Reed. The Bills do have a decent offense. Who do the Steelers really try and key in on? Is it Marshawn Lynch in the running game, or do they try and key, on, key in on, on Lossman and a hobbled Reed? Well, I think more than likely the Steelers are going to go after the run game and force Lossman to make throws. If the Steelers can come out on defense and hold Marshawn Lynch to maybe 40, 50 yards, then they're going to have – very much success against the Bills offense because J.P. Lossman, while he's a decent quarterback with, a, with his best wide receiver banged up and a couple guys on O-line are banged up as well, it's going to be hard for him to uh, stay in the pocket as well as uh, it's going to be hard for Lynch to run because they're really going to be keen on that. All right, and to wrap things up, why don't you give us a look into your insight for the college football weekend and okay. your picks for this weekend. Uh, picks for this weekend uh, for the local teams. West Virginia right now is uh, playing Maryland. I expect WVU to come out on top in that one. Uh, Pitt and Michigan State, probably the most intriguing matchup. I'm going to take Pitt, take the home team in that one. Uh, West Virginia, like I said, is going to more than likely pull it out against Maryland. And watch out for the Buffalo Bulls in the upset special. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Penn State is going to be my pick for that game. All right, our very own Frank Caliendo. Many thanks to Bill Romango. He'll return later on in the show. The women's volleyball team went 2-1 and one in Riverside, California this past weekend, led by the strong play of Tanya Storino. The senior setter earned the Northeast Conference Player of the Week honors for her performance, averaging 47 assists throughout the weekend, and she had 13 kills on 27 attempts. The 5-4 and four Colonials return to action Friday when they take on Howard at the St. Francis of PA Tournament. 
There's more sports-related activities just around the corner. We're hitting the gridiron again, hard. CSC back in 60. The women's field hockey season is underway and off to a rough start after losing their first home game of the season and three road games following that. This past weekend, the ladies had two home matchups as Mercyhurst came to town Saturday. To Joe Walton, we go. Colonial head coach Olivia Nedzler looking for her first career win. Courtney Bertoloni's pass to Gwen Dolphin gets deflected as Jennifer Coleman is able to come up with the save. Mercyhurst now will get the ball. Watch Courtney Witchy get in the way of her own teammate. RMU comes back on offense. Bertoloni again to Dolphin who comes up through the legs of Courtney Looper and takes the shot, but again, Coleman is going to come up with the save. This time, Bertoloni is going to try and find a different one of her teammates. Shauna Kuzner in front of the net. She will find the inside for her first goal of the season. Kushner went on to score another goal as the Colonials went on for the 2-1 victory. With Coach Joe Walton taking a leave of absence the past week, the rest of the Colonials football staff had to take on extra duties. One coach stepping up is special teams and defensive line coach John Banizak. The former defensive end won three Super Bowl rings with the Pittsburgh Steelers and spent the end of his career in the NFL tutoring Hall of Fame defensive end Reggie White. Coach Banizak sat down with Colonial Sports Center producer Scott Gomick to discuss his coaching philosophy in this year's Colonials team. Coach Banizak, thank you for joining us on Colonial Sports Center. I think it's fair to say that a large population uh, of the students here at Robert Morris don't know about your decorated past playing in the NFL. Um, just for all the fans, having three Super Bowl rings uh, and being the defensive MVP, uh, could you talk about playing with the Steelers and uh, being a part of one of the greatest franchises uh, in the NFL. Well, you're absolutely right. I played um, with a great franchise. I played on the greatest football team to ever play the game of football. I played with nine Hall of Fame players, a Hall of Fame coach, Hall of Fame owners. Uh, it was a tremendous experience for me. Um, you know, the game of football has been in my blood since uh, I think I took my first wa steps walking as a as a, a baby and I and, uh, played the game all through um, you know, grade school, high school, college and had an opportunity, a chance to play professional football and um, things worked out for me. This past week has been awfully sad for the football team, the staff and Robert Morris in general. Uh, from the practice standpoint with Coach Walton not there in absence uh, at the game at Monmouth, what was the team's uh, atmosphere or feelings during practice and then even in the game? Is there an extra motivation maybe to bring a win home? I think that the um, certainly the the attitude of the football team was one of heavy heartedness. Um, it's it's tough when you lose a family member and, and a lot of young kids have not been through a difficult situation like this emotionally. Um, you know I have no idea what Coach Walton uh, went through last week on a personal level. It had to be very difficult. He and Ginger were married for 47 years and they were very much in love and they did everything together. And she is a model of courage. Obviously going into to Monmouth, um, you know, without coming out and saying win one for the Gipper, we wanted to win that football, that football game to give some kind of comfort to Coach Walton and his family. 
um, to let them know that, you know, we were fighting um, for him and, and, and our thoughts and our prayers were with him and his family at the time. This week's home game against St. Francis uh, last week, a great success, or last year, great success against St. Francis. You just preview the matchup for this weekend. Well, it, it's interesting you mentioned last year's game. Uh, on, um, on Monday, um, Coach Walton gave me a um, piece of paper and talked about upsets and uh, why teams get upset. And one of the, item, uh, one of the um, uh, suggestions he had was that uh, teams get upset when a year before they played that team, they had a big game against them um, by a wide margin. We beat them 45 to 13 last year. That has no bearing on this year's game. We have to guard against uh, the complacency that goes along with uh, having a good game against them a year ago. And, and a lot of that is a mental attitude going into the game. And I think our kids are at a level right now where they understand that um, this is the most important game of the season. And if they have that attitude, they believe that uh, we'll have a good game on Saturday. Well, we're hauling our personal lineman back in for the second part of our two-a-day session. Bill Romango, why don't you give us some insight into the Monmouth game? I would love to do that, AJ. A uh, big win. We're going to go in a uh, big win for the game for Robert Morris early. You see uh, a lot of uh, arm tackles by Robert Morris, a problem that they had in the first quarter, but eventually got that taken care of later. If you see here, you get into that area where there's not a lot of defenders there, but Robert Morris still comes up and is unable to make the tackles on that play, but they would correct that problem later. You see here a play action pass. Solinsky drops to his right, avoids the defender and looks downfield, and there is my friend Supa Mario Hines. Once again, we're going to take one more look at it. You see on the bottom of your screen, running back Miles Russ makes a great block to stop the defender right before he gets to Swalinski. He has enough time to get over to the side and throw it to Mario Hines down the field. Now, if you look at the top of your screen, Julian Ellison is going to make an amazing move, one that you might only see in Madden if you ever see this again. We're going to take a look at it one more time. We'll slow it down right as he breaks down. The defender, the defender left his jock strap about the 30-yard line, and the ball is in the end zone. Touchdown, Robert Morse. Here we see a nice toss play to Miles Russ. You see him get up the field into the hole, dodge past the safety, and get downfield for a nice gain of about 20, 25 yards. If you look here, look at all the Monmouth defenders on the ground. That creates great running room for Miles Russ. A great job by the offensive line for Robert Morse. And we're going to take a look at one more play. Uh, Oh, that hurts. Uh, left guard, check me out, number 70, Bill Romango. Got kind of whipped around and, oh, a knee injury. I'm going down. We're going to look at it one more time. No, we're not, thank <laughs> God. But uh, I did injure my knee in that game. Uh, my right knee, I uh, have a partial tear of my MCL, so I'll be out uh, about two weeks. But I should be all right, good to go. Well, that was unfortunately one of the bad things that we took yeah. out of the Monmouth game. And hopefully you will come back soon. In the meantime, yes. you'll be joining us. And lots of good I'll things to take out. Who had the most impressive individual performance on Saturday? Well, obviously, you got to look at uh, Michael Walzer. He, uh, you know, just after coming back from the Dayton game, doing very poorly there, and then coming in with about 43 seconds left, a 34-yard field goal, wins the game for Robert Morris. A lot of pressure on his shoulders is now relieved. And you also have to look at uh, the Robert Morris coaching staff as a whole, filling in for Joe Walton uh, when he was dealing with his family issues and the uh, passing of his wife. Uh, specifically coach uh, John Banizek, who we saw earlier in the show, and uh, Dan Radikovich. Both those guys really brought the defensive, offensive, and special teams units together as a whole, brought everybody together. And like Coach Banizek said, without getting into a win one for the Gipper, he really, you know, illustrated the importance of this game to Robert Morris and to Joe Walton, and we went out there and won it for him. What was the emotion like throughout the week um, going into the game and throughout the game? Uh, the, the emotion, the only way I can just describe it is uh, strange. The, uh, I, personally, as a player, I've never had a head coach who wasn't there. And obviously, you know, Coach Walton has to deal with his family issues. But at the same time, it's the coaching staff, like I mentioned earlier, really brought everyone together. You know, you kind of go into practice like, okay, what do we do now? Well, you just keep doing the same things that you've always been doing. It's just Coach Walton isn't there. He talks to the coaches at night on the telephone and uh, talks to them in person when they go to his house. And 
Coach Walton laid down a great game plan and the coaches delivered it to us perfectly and obviously we understood it enough that we went out there and beat the Monmouth Hawks. Looking ahead to St. Francis this weekend, it's been historically a one-sided relationship in favor of Robert mm -hmm. Morris, but what do the 2007 Red Flash bring to the table? What the Red Flash bring to the table is the Blitz game. Uh, they're one of the best teams in the NEC at blitzing, bringing linebackers from all angles. They run a 3-4 defense, but at the same time, they'll walk a safety up to make it uh, eight guys in the box. They may drop two linebackers off and they'll only have four in the box on uh, third and longs on specific passing downs. But the Red Fasts are, are great at blitzing. So what the Ro Colonials have to do on the offensive line is uh, control the football, keep things together, get the ball going, and that's how it's done. Well, the whistle's blowing, coach is letting it go. Two-a-days are over. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Get some rest. Thanks to Bill Romango. Last season, tight end Jarvis Powers led the Colonials with a total of 421 yards while collecting five touchdowns before graduating this past spring. His days at RMU may be over, but Powers hasn't given up on football just yet. The connections he has made with Northeast Conference players, including former Monmouth Hawk and current Dallas Cowboy Miles Austin, may have got him an opportunity to play for the New York Dragons. We got a call from Jim Garrett, the uh, former scout for the Dallas Cowboys. Got invited to work out for him uh, amongst some other players from Monmouth and, and one double A schools. They sent me up to New York to uh, work out with the New York Dragons, Arena One team up there. And um, hopefully they like me and then um, they'll sign me in January and uh, we'll go from there. We're going to give you 60 seconds to brace yourself because he is about to get really angry. The second ass hat of the season, next on CSC. Not since it was revealed that the 1951 World Series was perhaps won via nefarious measures and stolen signals by the New York Giants has New York led the nation in such an uproar regarding cheating in sports. Now Jets fans in the entire NFL are ready to string Bill Belichick up by his windbreaker. It appears via Belichick's ambiguous and hazy apology on Wednesday that the Patriots are guilty of subverting the rules. In this age of technology, aiding every piece of football game planning, the Patriots were resorting to stealing the signals used by the Jets defensive staff in New England's 38-14 victory on Sunday. It is baffling. Belichick is considered one of the greatest defensive minds in the game. But this blatant cheating is not only incomprehensible, but also morally reprehensible. Bill, we are partially at fault for not seeing the signs. Like the family of a burgeoning drug addict, we should have pulled you into the kitchen for a sit down after you traded for Randy Moss. We should have questioned when you brought in the troubled Brandon Merriweather from a delinquent Miami Hurricanes program. We did not. Your Patriots were easy to dislike prior to Sunday's debacle, Mr. Belichick. Now you and the rest of the team is the most hated program in football. Wear your ass hat proudly, Bill. Perhaps it'll help you revise the ethical standards, or lack thereof, you've displayed. Here's a look at some of the RMU home sports that you can catch this week. Saturday, women's soccer versus Bucknell at 11 o'clock. Football is at 1 at Joe Walton Stadium. And Tuesday, women's soccer versus Howard at 4 o'clock at the North Athletic Complex. We have run out of time for Kelly Burke, Bill Romango, and everyone here at CSE. I'm Andrew Chiapese. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.